Greetings in the name of the Most High, Yahweh, Elohim, God, Jah, the One, Yeshua, Jesus, the rejected one, remember? The stone rejected. Peter said, we become living stones. What are living stones? Well, living stones of offense. I've been, you know, I'm going to share this with you because it's been bothering me. So it's going to bother me, then I'm going to bother you. Fourth. Okay, if it bothers me, then I bother you. Um, all right, if it's going to bother me, then I'm going to bother you. How are you doing being a living stone of offense? Answer. Many aren't. So while brothers and sisters are being harassed, you're not. You're blending in. Which is not really completely fair, right? to your supposed brethren who are hauling your water. Okay? Now, last time I said it's understandable. It's perfectly understandable. And that being said, now you don't know where I'm going to go. That being said, uh, let's look at, um, I saw a movie, probably there's maybe three or four filmmakers that have come along, and not counting some of the older ones, I should, I should count them too, who've really mastered the medium and really being able to do something with it in a way that's, that's very deep and gets at the whole purpose of art, which is to get at the truth of humanity's situation. One such filmmaker, a director, his name is Wayne Kramer. I believe he's uh, related to the great Stanley Kramer, who made lots of great movies in the past. You know, Wayne seems to be more in the... He's almost like kind of, I guess he, you could compare him to like the Cone brothers, a little bit of Tarantino, a little bit of Stanley Kubrick, but he's like on that level. And um, so being that, you know, I grew up with the movies and am qualified to review them uh, and have actually professionally in the past. So let me go ahead and say this. Uh, The movie was called, that I saw, it was just released on, on the Dish Network, but it was in the theaters, and I think I saw people getting up in arms about it, you know, uh, some critics, the movies I like, critics will lambast it, I'm not sure what the critical reviews were, but I believe they were mixed. The film is called Pawn Shop Chronicles, has a bunch of very good um, actors, um, incredibly well made. Uh, it's an allegory. It's a satire, kind of like the Coen Brothers. It's got lots of, you know, it's got a violent edge to it, like maybe a t kind of like a Tarantino sort of twist to it. Um, but I believe it goes beyond anything Tarantino's done because it goes to. Uh, I guess you could put a little bit of Robert Rodriguez in there, the Austin filmmaker that he does the Machete series along with. He's done a lot of, a lot of different movies. Anyway, so this was, uh, you know, it's got to go right up there with like The Game. David Fincher is another director that I would put in that list. The Game. Uh, um, 
you know, Dr. Strangelove, Oh Brother, Where Art Thou? I mean, there's a bunch, there's a, I have a list, I should probably put a list together of, you know, uh, The Big Empty was another one that discussed the uh, anger management was another one, but I'm not saying that, that was not a great movie, but it dealt with the same subject. Anyway, this was profound, especially if you're a believer. What we've been talking about here, the split in DNA. What we've been talking about here, the, uh, the, the, the fact that we have you know, the good and evil within us. I mean, we're talking about everybody. I mean, this is not a message to, say, Christians, because I don't even really relate to the term Christian at all. I relate to... I, I, it's just because it's so limiting of what I think about God. It's just so ridiculous compared to where Lord, the Lord has shown me and taken me. And I believe there's a Lord. Obviously, there's, I say Lord. What I mean by that is creator, savior. The Old Testament says the Lord God is our savior. Well, then if Jesus is the savior, then he's the Lord God in the flesh who came into this world to redeem humanity, to, get to, to, to legally redeem humanity. Um, out of this cursed situation, which is basically also allegorical and multidimensional and holographic and impossible for most people to understand, and they don't. I found that I uh, talked to a lot of people about the Lord, about who he is, no clue. What he is, no clue. Why any need for salvation, things are fine, no clue. Why this is fine, the situation that you find yourself in today, you feel is fine. Yeah, it's the other guy's fault, not mine. I'm fine. They're not fine. They, the, especially those Christians, they're not fine. And the Muslims, they're not fine. And, the, and, then the, and then, well, but the secular atheists and so forth, they're fine. The slaves of the authoritarian regime, they're fine. The people that go along with... See, tyranny today isn't tyranny. Tyranny today is extinction event. I don't think you quite understand. I, I guess... You see, there's no team. There's no Jews, no Muslims, no Christians, no atheists. No left, no right. There's nothing like that. It's not even, that's not even what, that's not even the para, that's so far removed from actually what is real that religion be, is the impediment to reality. But so is philosophy, so are golf clubs, so is an, a, a suit and tie, so is, uh, you know, um, anything that you fancy. The Tulip Society is an impediment I found in traveling the country, and I've had to, you know, keep my powder dry, lay low. I'm not, you know, wearing anything on my sleeve because I am the sleeve. So this movie, um, basically, it was three stories. And it had to do with retribution, redemption, salvation, God and Satan, and the situation. Everything we've talked about here about the split within. Right? You have good and evil within you. Then you have some sort of breach. A corruption in your physical being. You get sick, you die. That's corruption. Not acceptable. Um... We do wrong things to get a right result. Yep, split within, that's, that's understandable, and we do it. We have that evil horn devil side, and then we got that amazing grace side, both in the same person. Yep, that's why we got Jesus. Let me take it one step further. So got to make that deal with the devil in order to like be acceptable, but then we, but then we can go to church that's, we're saved. Say, 
If I bow my... This is the message. If I bow my knee to the devil, if I take the world's deal for secularists, if I go ahead and agree to bow down to become a slave, but, it, but then, you know, vetted and a la familia, and I get to have a track to run around, a, a show to put on, a thing to do. If I agree to make it nice, if I agree to go along, if I agree to sell out, I then get to sing Amazing Grace. Because I'm saved. But first, I gotta bow down to the devil, and then I get to be saved. I don't. This is not some hyper thing. This is normality, excuse me. And then, of course, there is no devil. I know that. There is no Satan. There is no. Judeo-Christian ethos from the Bible. None of that's real. Don't you understand that? You're in the wrong paradigm, the wrong model. Now no, it's a... Whatever game show you like, this is just a game show. And the game show is... You know, in this order, bow down to the devil. And here's Jesus to save you. And everybody sings with one voice now. And isn't it lovely? We're all part of one family as Christians. Because we all have the same root, don't we? We all sing the same song. We all have the same nod and the same wink. So we're the church. So this film, Pawn Shot Chronicles, was all about that. Believe it or not, I kid you not. Wayne Kramer laid it out. I just kept, I wanted to see where it was going. As soon as the angel of death showed up as a cowboy with a, the perfect shotgun for this kid to go get his revenge, and he had a cross on his belt buckle, and he came from another world, had this shiny shotgun. He just showed up in this field like an angel, and an angel of death tattoo. And the, his buddies ran him over. They're all meth heads, and he was going to go back and get revenge go to the meth lab where they were trying, his buddies that ran him over were trying to rip off the meth guy. and So he went there with a shotgun to even things out. I'm not going to kind of spoil it for you, but what the, what the angel said, he said, this is for your salvation, and handed him the shotgun. Perfection. What a perfect scene. But no, it gets better. Then there's the Elvis impersonator running around in his story. And then there was a guy that, that saves somebody from, uh, his wife went missing and he found a ring in a pawn shop and traced it down violently to, the, to a guy who was keeping all these women in cages. Again, who is that guy keeping women in cages? Who are the women in cages but an allegorical look at humanity, right? Being kept in a cage, all competing to be the number one, the one who could go into the house on occasion. Otherwise, they were naked and pooping on themselves in their cages. Once a week, the best one would get to come in the house and maybe watch TV for 30 minutes, sort of based on news items, but really it had nothing to do with that. And then we have the Elvis guy. Total loser, totally broke. Everyone doesn't like him. He goes to get his sideburns evened up, and the guy cuts him. Another guy just gouges his sideburns, and he's trying to be at the county fair doing the thing, and nobody cares, and nobody likes him. Then you've got Satan, who appears in the beginning outside a rib joint. This all takes place in the South. And Satan is outside the rib joint handing out tracts for Jesus. He's handing out tracts. Okay. Oh, he's a nice, just an average guy, older guy, trying to get people interested in Jesus and saying he's not doing too well. And uh, the Elvis guy just tosses the thing away. 
It's revealed later. At that point in the film, you don't know that he's, you know, Satan. He's handing out tracks. Another perfect image, another kudo for Wayne, who made the film. Um, but it, gets, it goes on, it gets better. The whole thing then comes to a crescendo third act, which is probably one of the most powerful I'd ever seen. It's right up there with the best. And it's a movie that it'll never have mentioned. It's like, it's like, you know, it's, it's like one of those movies that will never see the light of day again. <laughs> but because, because an intelligent film is shunned by society because they're too stupid to get it. It's like Only God Forgives was another luminous film. And Rex Reed takes off on it like, they shouldn't even be allowed to make film. What's Ryan Gosling thinking? He shouldn't, his manager should keep him strapped down so he can't do things like this anymore. Because obviously that film disturbed Miss Reed if he, if he even saw it. So Reed kind of stands for the, for the group, for the ethos, for the dumbed down kind of masses who are too stupid to think for themselves and too lazy to get over their stupidity. And this... So when I see something brilliant like Kramer's film, I'm like, oh, wow, isn't that awesome? Isn't that what art is supposed to do? There it is in your face. I, I don't know if I should spoil the third act, but even if I tell you what it is, it's, you still have to see it because there's nothing I could say. It's the whole nuanced kind of way that he goes. It's the whole way the thing is made. You're... Even if, I, if, even if you know the story, you wouldn't, you wouldn't even think. You, you'd be so uh, blown away by the imagery and by the, the outrageousness of the whole situation that you would just be drawn in. It wouldn't matter if you knew the plot or not. Should I give it away, Trish? Yeah. I'm going to give it away. So people that don't want a spoiler, here you go. It's, a spoiler's coming. So here's the deal, and this is the reason I'm bringing it up. So he goes in one barbershop, the Elvis guy. This is the crescendo after all the other two acts. It's, it's three stories rolled into one, okay? Um, you have the meth heads. You got the guy whose wife went missing, who tracks down a ring to find out where she is. Um, and, and his bludgeoning of the, uh, and killing of the guy who uh, kept all these women in cages. And then the wife killing him in retribution because she didn't want her captor killed. <laughs> then, no, no, that's, that's just the warm-up. Um, it gets better. The, so the Elvis guy is kind of wandering around throughout in and out of the movie during these other two stories. And he's out at the county fair, and he's broke, and he's got... He can't even afford a cup of coffee. He's pulling pennies out. He's trying to offer two free tickets to the fair. It's free anyway. <laughs> so to come see him in order in exchange for like some eggs in the morning. And he's just kind of laughed at. The guy standing outside is trying to hand him some tracks, you know, for his redemption and salvation. There was another angel of death guy that was in there giving this kid a shotgun saying, for your salvation. So the bottom line is, so the Elvis guy is finally performing, and his girlfriend leaves him. He, he, he tries to go to the barber shop. The, there's two barber shops. One competes. You either, you know, you either Doc's a guy named Doc, a guy named Cook. You either a Cook guy or a Doc guy. And if you go to one barber shop, the other one didn't want you. If you go to the other barber shop, the other one didn't want you. He's just kind of like, God, oh, this is a weird time. He's the outsider, the Elvis impersonator, who's always in costume. He's the outsider, played by Brendan Fraser, which he's a great actor. So he, he was the outsider. He doesn't, people don't know him in the barbershop. They don't know him in the cafe. They don't know him in the rib joint. They don't know him. He's kind of like, he, he gets interviewed on TV, but they don't know who he is. He's trying to drive his Cadillac like Elvis, but he keeps running out of gas. He's got no money to put into it. He just keeps losing one thing after another. One bad luck. And one guy, the other barbershop, the guy gets mad. And 
puts him in the chair. Then he takes his razor and just cuts the back of his neck. He goes, you cut me. Not, not severe, but he just did it to just diss him, you know. He didn't know. It almost looked like he didn't even know why he did it. And he got the heck out of there and pasted on some fake sideburn, even up the sideburns that the barbers butchered. Then he's supposed to perform at the county fair where he's got a little cassette recorder, put the microphone down there, and then he pretends he's Elvis with these old women dressed in kind of like American flag type thing, trying to light fireworks or whatever. And it's terrible, and the tape breaks, and people tell him he sucks, and he ought to go home, and they laugh at him, and they just, you know, town is not impressed. Again, he's the outsider, remember. He doesn't know anyone. He's just passing through. To... So what ends up happening is, you know, so there's the evangelist, you know, and, and he's outside this bar, you know, before that, and there's a black guy out there playing the blues on the guitar, singing about the devil. He's outside, actually, a liquor store. The liquor so- store says... 666 something street. And the evangelist is out there. Just the, the black blues singer. Somehow the idea that he's like a guy from the South, you know, a real authentic, original blues man from the South, it just gives it that atmosphere. You know, playing a blues and singing about the devil. And so there in the street is the evangelist. And he's completely down on his luck outside. And a guy asked him, how's it going? He goes, you know, there's, there's just some things in this world. He, he lays it on him. He tells him, you know, he, at this point you don't know he's Satan. Because he's been handing out tracts for Jesus. And uh, so he tells him, you know, there's just some things, that's what, you know, there's, there's something you can do that, you know, will bring all your dreams to come true. That this the whole thing could be turned around. You know, all the bad things have happened. Just one thing after another. It doesn't have to be like that. So everybody's got to do something to make it work out. So he offers him a deal, and he goes, hey, "You want and you want my soul, right?" And uh, and and and, but you don't know what that means. You don't know what it means that everything will be all right. I mean. One thing after another, no gas, no food, no girlfriend, no, ding, 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 pawning his Elvis uh, medallion, you know, trying to get 20 bucks just to have some gas. Anyway, so it's just being cut by the barber, being butchered by the other guy in a sideburn, being, um, you know, being interviewed on TV, but being, you know, causing a, uh, oh, the other thing is when he was in the barber shop. People start following him, the Elvis guy. They start following him around the town. And then they're, they're looking, they're, be, they're standing behind him while he's trying to decide which barbershop to go into. And they're watching him and they're betting on, they're, wa- they're all watching him wherever he goes. And they're betting on what he's going to choose, either this one or that one. Which one are you going to choose? And when he chooses one, they all start fighting each other. So there's a riot going outside with these people that showed up out of nowhere and uh, the barber accuses him of causing a riot. Wherever he goes, they're following him, following him, watching him. And then, like I say, with the choice of the barber shop, the ones who guessed wrong what he would choose were fighting the ones who guessed right. So they're kind of telling him, hey, this is no good for you to be around here. Look at, we can't have the town like this. So I didn't do anything. I just came in here for to get my sideburns e- evened up. I didn't do anything. And these, what I would call utterly ignorant people who have no life, they spend their time following him around and watching him everywhere he goes. He's on TV. They're following him. They're, they're like, he's almost as if the Elvis impersonator is on some sort of closed circuit TV being watched, kind of like the Truman Show. And they're cheering when he does something that they think he's going to do. And they fight with each other when, he, when there's a disagreement over what he might choose or which way he might go left, right, or straight. They're watching all of this. Utter fascination. 
following him everywhere he goes. And whenever he encounters people, <clears throat> they throw sand in his face. They humiliate him. It's just terrible. He's having a terrible time. He's fumbling and bumbling and about to get fired from a, sh a show that he's not even getting paid for. Am I making myself painfully clear? Am I making myself... I'm hoping that this will be so painful, this podcast, that perhaps this would be the last one we ever need to do. And look, I'm talking about a secular movie. So you're starting to get the gravity of the situation. <clears throat> you're starting to understand the, the genius of the film. And then um, we'll explain who Elvis is in a minute. No, it's not just you who feel like you've been put upon by the world, no. It's, 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 there's, there's, well, it maybe is, but there's more levels to it. Uh, you know, if they're not following you around and watching and gambling on what you might choose, hey, hey, guys, I just, I went to the cleaner. He went to the cleaner, and I got my shirt repaired. He got his shirt repaired, says the chorus. And then I went, uh, you know, skiing. Hey, look, yo, know, he went skiing. Now, that's a form of intimidation and humiliation that if you know what's going on, because they, they figure they're so stupid, they figure you're just as stupid as them, so you would never know that they're watching you and laughing at you. Knowing full well that you're not one of them. He's the Elvis impersonator. He's an impersonator. He's an imposter. He's not even in the town, really. He doesn't really have a place where he lives. And they're following him around. They saw him on TV, and they're, he's kind of like, looks like they, and whenever they see him, they go, are you a magician? No, no, I'm, I'm Elvis. I'm an Elvis impersonator. Are you a magician? So finally, he gets on the stage in the end, and I told you, he'd already been offered a way out of his situation by the evangelist. He called his mother and said, Mama, Mama, he's from South Carolina. He says, Mama, I'm about to make this deal with Satan. Standing outside the liquor store, 666-something street. I forget the name of the street. I'm going to make this deal because I want things to go well. I just, I can't take it anymore, Mama. And then in the name he says to uh, the devil, who is, he goes, Mama, I just met the devil. Remember, he's the evangelist handing out tracts for Jesus. Mama, I just met the devil, and I, I think I'm going to take the deal. Mama, my, and she was hysterical and distracted, so he hung up. He goes to the devil, he goes, who's a nicely dressed man, just not wealthy, or anything, just an, a nice looking man, older, glass, conservative looking. He goes, I'll, I'll get back to you on that, okay? Here, here's a ticket to the show, will you? Come out to the show, okay? I'll be looking for you. He goes, well, I'll be there. He goes, he didn't say it that way. He said, I'll be around. So he goes to do the show, and these feeble kind of old ladies are trying to put, look like young girls having sparklers for the Elvis thing, and it's, it's just pathetic. Tape recorder breaks. The microphone <clears throat> that's down there with the tape recorder trying to put it through the PA system breaks. His costume rips. People are laughing at him. He's having a totally humiliating time. The people from the town who had followed him are now laughing and pointing, just telling him to go home. He's a loser. He's being humiliated on stage by a series of events, not necessarily of his own doing. He's trying, but he's doing the best he can. That's the other point. He's doing the best he can. So then he looks out the crowd. There's no crowd, really. They're just dispersed people walking by in a county fair, right? They're just walking by. He sees the devil out there, the guy from the liquor store, the evangelist handing out tracts for Jesus. That's what you think he is most of the time until then. And, and, in it, and, it, and it is completely defeated self, humiliated before all the world, a failed Elvis impersonator, 
he looks at the, the guy and he goes, I accept your offer. And suddenly, everything changes radically. Suddenly, he's in a new costume. You know, this is just like an instant karma thing. You know, he's got this nice Elvis impersonator outfit on, whatever. He's got the, um, the black women, the really pretty black girls as a backup man singing, you know, with, you know, you know, with the outfits on, with the really expensive outfits and with their long gloves and, you know, like the Supremes of old or something, backing him up. Backing up Elvis, the same kind of girls who would literally back up Elvis on the same level of beauty and accomplishment. Uh, the crowd, he... So as soon as he accepts the devil's offer, and he says, look, the lights change, everything changes, he, uh, the music swells up, and it's amazing grace. And so for the rest of the film, you see the rest of the stories winding up while Elvis is singing amazing grace, drawing a huge crowd huge enthusiasm, and he's saying, thank you, Lord, and everyone's saying, praise Jesus, and everyone's in agreement. The whole town now is his friend because they're all nodding up and down, yep, because <clears throat> they all took the deal too, because that guy's been around that town forever, right? Everybody was in on it but him, and now they're all celebrating and uh, singing Amazing Grace and giving thanks to God. You know, just like they do in church, because they go to church, everybody. What do you think about that? No, I don't know what else to tell you. But it's a perfect reflection of the DNA. In other words, I take the devil's offer, and I sing Amazing Grace. And I say, thank you, Lord. And... Look how good my life is going. I give all thanks to God, he says, when, with the new outfit and the new fame. And he gets a job offer to go to eight states with this guy that puts on the county fairs and good salary and everything works out. So he gives all thanks to God for making it possible for him to have a life. Lord, I guess you really wanted me to say that. And so the story, Pawn Shop Chronicles, is kind of like a, an allegory about humanity. In other words, it rises to that level as art. And not just gratuitous violence or whatever. There's all a purpose to the whole thing. And so that's why I call it brilliant and the, the meaning that came through, the genius allegory, Completely, uh, and, and the filmmaking, of course, is superb, top-notch. doesn't get any better than that. So there you go. I was so happy to see that, that somebody else, well, you know, authors and artists and people have been grappling with this, but that somebody put it so succinctly, so clearly available to the modern viewer of movies, so clearly understood by anyone who's been through anything, would look at that and go, yeah, you might not feel so good, but you'd go, yep. Yep, I, I understand. Because as soon as he took the deal, I mean, it's magic time. Everything changed. Like, suddenly from being followed around and gossiped about and fought over and spied on and, you know, cutting a thing and people not even giving him a, an egg to eat down on his luck, to all lovingly adoring him and all nodding their heads up and down in agreement, singing with him all in unison, amazing grace. And it was the Elvis amazing grace that was he was lip syncing with that, with that, because that's what he does. He does, he lip syncs Elvis. So he's lip syncing, you know. But then it's kind of like he's singing, but it's the Elvis version of Amazing Grace. And he justified by saying, you know, Elvis didn't live long. But he had a he had a really blessed life. I mean, he came to the conclusion that Elvis took the same deal from the same devil in order to be famous. 
so that Elvis could sing Amazing Grace too. So Elvis could sing all those songs about the Lord. He said he must have taken the deal because there's no other way. Can you believe how much truth was packed into that movie? I can't believe it got by the censors who want everyone to be dumbed down and stupid so that, you know, they just want to be able to put you in slavery and not, and not pay you the fame and fortune. They want to take your soul without having to, to pay because they run out of dough. They run out of magic. They run out of power. Things are kind of tough right now. For all Satan and his buddies who basically corrupted the DNA so that they could, they and they alone are the only ones that could make the offer. We can fix that. Just say yes. The band yes? Yes, that, the whole point of yes is the band yes. Why would they be any different than everybody else? So they're encouraging you to say yes. That's why they named the band yes, so you would say yes. Yes, just say yes. It can happen to anyone. It can happen to you. It could happen to me. Um, and so that is why... Oh, Lord, this is the heaviest of... I, you may not see me for a while. This is just horrifying. So basically, that's what's really going on, right? While you're watching the news and watching everything else, this buying and selling of souls, because remember... The people behind a guy like that are buying and selling and betting on, you know, on the price of meat. And they're betting to see if he'll take the deal or not, what, which way he'll go. So no one's being honest with him. He's being bought and sold behind his back, left and right, left for dead on the side of the road, laughed at as a laughing stock. In other words, being treated kind of like Jesus was treated, only in a much more elongated fashion. Am I making myself finally, is it finally beginning to dawn on you that the life situation here is quite simple? That there really is? Because you see, nobody has the power Nobody has the power to make your life transform like the Elvis impersonator literally overnight. I've only seen that from one source where parents will eagerly push their kids into it and then have like a bar mitzvah celebration as almost a rite of passage to accept the devil so you can have the pudding, Jesus. You don't want to have happen to you what happened to Jesus. The Lord doesn't expect that, no. You go ahead and sell your soul to the devil, and then we'll redeem it with Jesus, and life is wonderful. Everyone nod in agreement, amen. And all the church. I've never seen such a great allegory about the, the complete joke of the Christian church, other than Wayne Kramer. He did the, I think he's done the, well, I'm trying to think of other incidents, I guess, I can't think of another allegorical movie. Uh, I don't know. You've had a few. But nothing, you know, I mean, you know, you had, in some case, the Big Lebowski was kind of a character like that. You know, sort of a, the ultimate loser who's offered a deal. But it's, it's not, it doesn't hit. This one hits, it really, it hits home. Pawn shop owner is Vincent D'Onofrio, who's, you know, made his debut, I believe, in Stanley Kubrick's uh, Full Metal Jacket. And uh, I, if I'm not mistaken, did he win an Academy Award? Or he should have, or he was nominated anyway. I'm, I'm not quite sure, but a tremendous, uh, amazing uh, actor. There, there's one amazing, they're all amazing. So see it, read them, in other words, read them and weep. You're not going to like this movie, what it says. But I'm here to tell you what it really means. I mean, what, what it didn't say is DNA. 
when, when, when the world tells you there is no other way, they're talking some physical about something physical. They may say, you know, in the ethers there's no other way, but really it's coming down to a physical problem. There's some kind of thing, a dimensional thing, that gets, you know, activated. Like software, you get activated if and only if you give up your soul. And at that point, that DNA is activated, and suddenly the world... It's not that you change. The world changes. Suddenly, it's a different dimension. It's a gateway. You can tweak the DNA to open up the dimension, the portals, to open up eternity even. So the DNA is also the path to slavery if you corrupt it. So unless you pay the soul, you're not getting your license, right? Just like software. So the movie would have us believe there is no other way and that Jesus is just really a tool of the devil. Now that is, you know, that's, I would say, the point that is... But see, that's looking at it from a purely carnal, secular, <clears throat> worldly point of view. The idea of the suffering of Christ is the suffering of the Elvis impersonator. You know, it was the same kind of suffering. And it was all needless, and he didn't do anything to deserve it. He just, he just jumped on him wherever he went. And, uh, and it wasn't overt, you know. It was, just, it was more subtle, which I, I like the, uh, the gentle hand in the filmmaking there and the storytelling. In other words, they didn't pound you over the head with an idea like, oh, he's a loser, look, they're picking on him. It was more subtle than that, which made the film even better, made the storytelling even better. Uh, so I, I can, you know, I give it four stars, uh, you know, AAA. This goes in the collection with, uh, you know, things like the Fight Club and the game and, you know, Lebowski, Strange Love, Big Empty, Anger Management for, for purposes of the same, it's the same story, basically. You know, in this case, Selling a Soul was kissing a girl in front of a stadium full of people because that was his phobia, but that's the one thing that he had to do to suddenly go up in life, but it's allegorical as well. Devil played by Jack Nicholson and the loser played by Adam Sandler. Same thing, same story, different, different take on it. Over and over again. What are we telling the stories about? We're telling the stories about the corrupt innards. Not free will. The basic I'm born, I have this thing, I got this timetable, uh, you know, time clock, I've got this limitation, I can't just, you know what I mean? I've got flesh, it's, I could be run through, I'm very delicate. This situation, this imprisonment, I'm born in this prison, I live so long, I suffer, I die, uh, mostly insignificant. Now, and the other thing was how the world will break somebody down until they, until they agree. Because Satan wants, it basically like your farm animals, and he wants that which is, you can only give through free will. That He wants that which God wants. Then he gives you Jesus. Remember, he's the evangelist handing out tracts. What a perfect image of the, the Catholic and Protestant and all denominational churches worldwide. It's Satan handing out the tracts. I, I always wondered why, when I would look at um, evangelical Christians, I would see the devil in each one of them. And I wondered, you know, what was I, why is it that in, that I only see that around the churches? There's this kind of mind control thing, there's a sheen, there's a certain way of dress, there's a certain uniformity of speaking. And, and, I, and I wonder why. Well, and I'm seeing that too with people, some people I know are like, kind of like that as well. And I, and I wonder, I've been thinking for about 20 years, what am I seeing? What, what is the change that's happened to that person? And then now, uh, you know, it's kind of like, look, you're not singing Amazing Grace in the choir unless, you know, you make a deal with me. You know who I am. And then, you know, you can have your Christian life. And everyone else took the same deal. And that's why they get so mad at you. Because how dare you bring this topic up when we had no other way? 
how dare you impugn our character of being weak. You know, you try walking in our shoes before you make a judgment, jerk. So that's the reaction to anyone that might mention. And I'm here to go even beyond that and say, hey, no, no, no worries. Wait a second. It's, in, it's not your fault. The doctrine of original sin, and here comes the real bombshell of today. The doctrine of original sin as laid out in the Bible is false. false it's falsely interpreted, I should say. It's not false. The, what's there is not false, but it's interpreted falsely. The narrative goes something like this. We're all fallen because of Adam, and we've all done evil because of Adam. And therefore, we need to be redeemed by Jesus, by Messiah, because we got a, a, so all humanity is punished because of Adam stumbling. That is simply false and a lie. But I would expect that from Satan. That's why it's the doctrine of the church, because it's Satan. The church is Satan. It's pure and simple. The entire foundation of the Christian walk is based on a lie. Isn't that amazing? The entire religion is false. All the theology is false because anything that's based on a corrupt, corrupt tree only grows corrupt fruit. No matter how much they study, no how scholarly they are, no matter how well read they are, no matter how learned these people are, have written all these glorious books and all this really good stuff about ethics and just like Buddhism, there's lots of ethics, there's lots of good stuff. But the foundation is false and based on a lie. The doctrine of original sin, you have to be, as a friend of mine said, you have to be insane to, to even believe that. That, um, you know, uh, the, the level of punishment of humanity based on Adam and Eve's story. You know, on, and, and the other thing is, and I, I can show you why it's a lie right now. Number one, God is sovereign, right? Omnipotent, omnipresent, uh, you know, omni everything, right? He is sovereign above all. He's he's all powerful, all knowing, you know, all everything. Okay, so he made Adam and Eve, right? So being God, he knew exactly what they would do, what they would choose, how they would behave. Otherwise, he wouldn't be God. End of story. I rest my case. I could rest. I could have. I could dismiss the case right there and proclaim myself the victor and walk on. But we can go on further, if you like. Um, so, with that in mind, you know, God intended for Adam and Eve to do exactly what they did with the serpent. And then he intended to step in to his own movie and basically chastise them all. And, you know, basically said, you know, it's, it's not a story. Look, it's not a story about Adam. It's a story about DNA. Adam and Eve and the devil is represent the corruption of the DNA of the of the two of the light and dark in one and the limitation, and then God's <clears throat> the play of the save plays the savior to save Adam, i.e., humanity. Everyone inherited that sin from Adam, and so because it's corrupt DNA. Hold on a second. Because it's corrupt DNA, man keeps getting into trouble over and over again, wars, rumors of wars, pain, suffering, Cain, Abel, blah, 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 and throughout history, just, it's just torturous, Babylon captivity, we're up one day, we're down the next, smack down, judgment of God, wars, rumors of wars, everyone unhappy, basically, and, 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 and just horrifying, horrifying violence of man against man, by people who did take that deal, by the way, so before they give themselves another Academy Award or another plaque on the wall, just know they're no different than you or me. We all have that. So our fruits, whatever we create, whatever we do, will have the imprint of our DNA. Would you agree? So we'll have both light and dark, good and bad, corruption and non-corruption, both. In other words, I got to sell my soul to the devil to sing Amazing Grace. Exactly. So that's the situation. Um, within the same vessel, you have uh, Jesus and, and Satan. 
it can't go all one way or another because you have light and dark. There's equilibrium. When they try to go too far one way, the pendulum swings way back the other way. There's a certain kind of sustaining equilibrium here. So the story of the twisting, even the, even the, the idea that there's a serpent and there's this, this twisting around a tree kind of thing and there's this you know, beguiling thing that's going on. And, you know, then, then people see them as a shining one, not a serpent, but like the Hebrew indicates a shining either serpent or even a being like an angelic being. And then other people, you, you feel like there's a sexual component there and there's this intertwining of, we're talking about DNA. And so there's this corruption that, yes, all humanity um, inherited. All of humanity inherited it, and it's uh, kind of a done deal. And um, so we need Jesus to redeem us um, and usually that means, uh, it doesn't mean you're not going to die for Jesus. I mean, it doesn't mean you can join a church and then they can come kill you all. It's disagreeing with you, let's say. Salvation becomes, okay, the next life. You know, I'll get out of this corrupt body and I'll move on with the Lord versus moving on with the devil or winding up in a worse situation like hell versus heaven. Heaven and hell both to me are metaphors. You know, I, 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 that's all I see them as. I've got to be honest with you. I don't see heaven as a solid state thing. I see just a, a multidimensional freedom out there. Let's call that heaven. And beings that have a certain sovereignty, let's call that heaven. And lots of things going on and, and versus being in a limited situation like this. Anyway, without the DNA as it is, without everything as it is, this wouldn't be. So what you have your Luciferians doing, or your, you know, the, they want to wipe out all plants and animals and humans on the planet because you know, they're, they're bent all the way the other way, but they feel like the creation, it's kind of not a Gnostic thing in, in masonry and some of the secret societies. They believe that you know, the creation itself is evil. Right? And, and they're basing it on what I just said. In other words, we're trapped here in this situation. That's why they want to go to the singularity. That's why they want to merge with machines. That's why they want to write their own ticket because God, you know, this is a terrible situation that we got placed in. We need to find our way out of it. And technology is the way they've chosen. And that will be, you know, their undoing, unfortunately. As, a, as almost every sci-fi book and story has, and even the Twilight Zone and everybody else, they've all warned about that, that technology is not your friend. But I mean, you know, look, it was offered to them and, you know, they're taking the deal and they're, they're hoping they can clone themselves into these robots that can live forever and, you know, beat the deal and time travel and, dinner, you know, have it all. And, and uh, you know, at the same time, you know, go around and their job in the universe, if they get out in their ships and stuff, will be to go around destroying all that's someone called good in order to eradicate the evil. So they think by eradicating the earth and the plants with, the, with their uh, uh, geoengineering chemtrails, which is really killing the plants and the humans, it's kind of like the intent. It's not to reflect sunlight back. The whole purpose of reflecting sunlight back into the atmosphere, which is what they say they're trying to do, is to um, destroy the ozone layer so that the radiation will kill the humans. And that there's no other reason. I mean, there's maybe five people at the top of the whole program that even know that. The, the, the rest of them think they're saving the earth, and who knows what they think. They're, they're obviously, you know, retarded to a certain point. The, the plane flyers, you know, the pilots and the, uh, the people that are, you know, making this stuff up and having it in canisters and putting it in the planes, and then, you know, you watch them. And, and what they're doing now out here is now they're deciding to, you know, let the drought end because they, they realize that people are seeing all the plants dead and they're blaming... They're starting to get curious about the chemtrails. So what they're doing now is letting it rain. It makes people happy. But they're laying them down into the clouds above them, above the rain clouds, and dropping the poison in the clouds so it rains down on the earth, and that's what's really killing the trees and the plants. So now you can expect floods because you see that they can drop all that into the water and figure that's like a, you know, a, some kind of expansionary device 
that will help them to, with their goal, which is to create a mass extinction event, which is what's actually really going on today, which is really the most important thing to be talking about. They're done with physicality. So you can call this, you know, the end and, you know, whatever. But they're done with it. I have stressed falsely, wrongly, that one shouldn't, you know, take the devil's deal and all that. You know, not falsely, but wrongly. No, it was, I mean, it was true what I did. It was true about what I said. I mean, like, that, that's, that's there, so. But falsely in the sense that, you know, it's false that that result would ever be achieved. It was false. My hope was, I guess childishly, that in repenting, people would repent. And, of course, people don't repent. They, they, um, they don't even deal with... Uh, Christians don't even deal with... Uh, you know, I, my hope was to be a prophetic voice to the Christian church. I, I wasn't really dealing with the outside world that much. I don't really deal with the pagans and the you know atheists and the, I don't really deal with them. I'm, it's to the church, and all I got back was, "Well, you must have a vendetta." Well, of course you'd say that if you're on the other side. Of course, I'd be a scary guy. You'd follow me around, wondering what I might do. If that's the case, you'd say I have a vendetta because I mean, if you were in my shoes, you'd be pissed that everybody played games and wore a mask and didn't deal honestly with you and, I mean, in the church, you know, and that they were playing a game with you and, you know, was, and, and really what, what we've been looking at, Wayne Kramer answered exactly, the church is Satan, period. For years, Trish and I were talking about this, you know, how do they, you know, operate like a hive where they turn and they turn almost robotically at times and like when they, when they turn their backs on us that one day. They just, they all turn in unison at the same time, like, like, like almost like they, but it was, but it was non-reflexively. Like when that guy cut, cut the back of the Elvis neck, it was just kind of like an afterthought, you know, it, it's, it's just, they just do stuff, you know, it's like there's a program that someone with a keyboard saying, turn left and, you know, and so, yeah, you get, you understand the game show, Truman show aspect of this whole thing. Um, so when to become a Christian, you have to bow down to the devil. That's just the bottom line. That's all. It is Satan. And I guess I have not really proclaimed it that strongly, but now at this point, I'm, no, I'm not saying it's bad. I'm not I'm like, you know, I see you guys. I, I've always wondered why you have a, 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 there's a different thing about you. And it's not, not, no, not, it's not good. It's, it's, it's hive mindish. It's robotic. You know, it's holographic. It's, I can see a lot of layers to it. It's just, you're not there. Most of you, you know, you're not, it's not you. It's not the you that you were made. It's somebody else. This was your breaking through to the other side is when you join the church. I understand. I get that now. And so for many years, we marveled about it. We didn't understand, you know. We didn't understand. We were just so naive. We just thought, and you wonder how many, you know, are... And the answer is, well, I guess the reason you see the evil going on is because if, you're, if you've given your soul to, you know, the devil, you've taken that deal, if you've taken the offer, then basically they have the right to chemtrail you to death, to war you to death to bankrupt your economy, to take your house, to take your children. They can do all that. You know what I mean? Because, well, who has your back? Oh, well, there, now you're being naive. You thought they, you know, your fellow humans would have your, each have your back because you're members of the same club. You didn't realize you have civil wars and you war against each other and you steal from each other. You didn't realize it breaks up into tribes, one tribe against another, one gang against another. Hey, all of you made that deal, but look, you're killing each other. So doesn't that make sense now? Man, I'll tell you, if I wasn't, if I didn't know that God existed right now, 
I'd feel no hope for humanity whatsoever with this talk. I'd feel completely hopeless. I wouldn't even want to ever talk again about any of these subjects because what gospel do I have to tell you about? You know, I can't tell you, well, I can say Jesus saves um, and the people who, you know, put that around, they are all belong to the devil. I always wondered why in the movie Angel Heart, made by uh, director Alan Parker, why that haunted me so much. I, it was the same story, basically. Why the devil, played by Robert De Niro, was always around the church, always around the church, always around the church. This theme is over and over and over again. And then there's a blues theme in the South again. What is this? What is this? What are we looking at? Church, the devil, church, the devil, church, the devil, church, the devil, church. The evangelist is the devil. The evangelist is the devil. The, evan ah. the people who all these people go to church and they're following this Elvis impersonator around. Yeah. What does all that mean? Which just means exactly what it says. It's, you just can't accept it. I mean, talk to myself. I just couldn't, you know, accept when I decided to speak online about the Lord, the goodness of the Lord and salvation of the Lord and the communion with the Lord and the whole thing about the Lord. I just didn't accept that it could be so utterly one-sided one because... Remember, DNA, it cuts both ways. The thing that's in us has good and bad, light and dark. So why would Jesus say, if you belong to the devil, which, you know, you belong to whoever your soul is with, then you're cut off. Why wouldn't he say, I'm here to rescue you from the devil And those of you who bow down to the devil, no problem. I'm here to save you, whether you like it or not. Well, cool, Jesus. I mean, I guess that's what humanity must think, that the church has to wrangle it around to, like, if you believe in Jesus, it doesn't matter whether you bow down to the devil or not. It doesn't matter who you thought you sold your soul to. You're redeemed. So nobody has to interrupt the system. Nobody has to bat an eye. Nobody has to be upset because you're covered like insurance. You're covered. So that thing you did to be, uh, you know, a member in good standing uh, is no problem for Jesus. Jesus has got you going to heaven. Jesus has got you going to heaven and all the good people agree in the church and nod and wink all at the same time like robots. Why is that, Lord? I kept saying, why, 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 why? And I finally got down to the truth of it. It's, it, it's, it's a manufactured genetic thing that was, you know, before the bodies. You know what I mean? It's, it's a physical thing. That's where the corruption goes to, which means you're kind of off the hook in a way. So there's my gospel. My gospel is, you know, um, wherever you're at, it's not really your fault. So the idea of blame is what I'm going to take off you right now. I, I don't think any of us should blame anything about anything. I think basically we're in a situation like we have a disease. We've got a problem. And that's why they want to eradicate humanity because we've got a problem. And they, the, 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 the people that want to eradicate humanity, they recognize that. And this may be a, kind of a pedantic way of dealing with it. But, it, you know, that's how they're dealing with it which also makes sense because nothing, they realize that nothing good can come of us, and that is true. We will always have these wars. We're always going to have this bickering. We're always going to have this fighting. We're always going to have these murders. We're always going to have all this violence. We're never going to have world peace. And that's why uh, there's another group of thought, another, another group of people who want to bring in um, a new species, you know, people like Jonathan Clack and others talking about that in their, in their prophetic uh, uh, utterances and so forth. A new species based on a different kind of DNA. In other words, fixing the problem with the DNA so we would be a new species. 
uh, but I believe that's a lie. I don't believe that's the intent at all. I believe the 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 go now is to go to machine, not not to uh, 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 another kind of DNA. Unless you want to take DNA and kind of have a wedding of the physical and the robot, I suppose. You, you you always need DNA for biological things. So I, I suppose you could do that. But but I mean there's no plan of a new species. There is no plan of that. There's the real plan at the very top is what I said in the beginning. It's it's no, there's no mystery, uh, Mr. Jagger. Uh there's no puzzling about Lucifer and what his goal is. The goal is to end humanity at an extinction level event. That's the goal. That's what the game is all about. There is nothing else to it. There's no mystery here. And it's taken this long to do it. Why? Because it's because the pendulum goes both ways. God is always checking, and then the devil's coming back, and then God comes back, and the devil, you know, right? So it never quite gets done. And meanwhile, humanity goes on suffering. And people are saying, well, we can't watch this suffering anymore. We can't take care of the people. We don't have the economy to pay them. We don't have the jobs. We need to basically depopulate the world. It's, it's, it's killing everything. And let the earth heal. Or, and, then, and then there's a more hardcore level beyond that of how can we use a super collider to destroy the entire universe because it's all bad. And that would be a good thing because this whole creation has been evil from the get-go. We, being the force of good, want to eradicate it, which is why we're playing with even technology beyond super colliders. I mean, technology that is like that, that spiral in the sky in Norway, you know. I mean, technology that basically, you know, blows planets up and stuff. So, um, but how can we have an un-Big Bang theory? You know, how can we have an un-Big Bang? How can we have a, or another Big Bang that destroys everything that is into a black hole that never existed in the first place? How can we bring that level event about and put an end to this as a way to peace. I absolutely understand and in fact sympathize with that point of view. I understand it completely. It makes sense in a, on a human level, but that's only on a human level. It makes sense that the self-loathing in man would lead to a, a conclusion like that, and also the pain in man, that man would decide to end the pain by ending this. That would be the real exunt from the stage and from the entire uh, lousy situation we find ourselves in. The good things of the world that we see uh, no longer hold because the evil is so big right now that it's hard to enjoy anything because you're always aware of, you know, that there's some horrible thing going on, that life is tenuous, that, you know, anything could happen anywhere, that there's no stability and there's nothing you can count on. So I say rely on God because there is a God, but then, you know, the argument is, well, why would God allow this? I mean, because of what Adam did? You have to be, as, a, as, a, as my friend said, you have to be insane to believe that. Yeah, absolutely insane. The doctrine of the Christian church, you have to actually be insane to believe it because it's completely illogical. And it's unspiritual. And it's ungodly to believe it. I always wondered why the church had the Inquisition, why they launched wars, why they're behind, why, well, why they practice satanic ritual and satanic ritual abuse and also trafficking of children. I mean, you know, and, and on all the things, the little things that you hear about in the news, uh, notwithstanding, you know, the priests and so forth. But why, why this? Why this? Why this? It's, of course, that's, given the DNA, I could tell you from reading the DNA, I could write the same story from Gen Genesis on. I could write the whole story based on the DNA. Adam did what he was programmed to do exactly. There was no choice. It was already written. Humanity has done what it was going to do, what it was programmed to do. Exactly. There was no choice. They want to get rid of whoever created this whole thing because obviously that's completely evil. 
And at the highest level, there's that kind of war going on. Religion has come down to me to be like political parties bickering. You know, my religion is good. His Muslims are bad. And I'm aware of the incredible violence of uh, Christians in the past, just like the violence of Muslims now. I've Just like the violence of... There's been violence of Buddhists against Hindus and vice versa too. And, you know, these, you, you, know, you don't see just... Um, you know, you have to have organized groups. Organized religion um, has been a tool of the devil from day one. It is the devil. Organized religion is the devil. So the person that told me that I had a, you know, I must have a vendetta or feel like he'd heard a podcast or two and felt like I had a vendetta. It's like, I have no vendetta. Why? Because Satan is the church. I have, a I have no vendetta at all. I just have a need to speak the truth and that's all this effort report's ever been about.